Hi everyone, it's MJ the Fellow Actuary and welcome to the second vlog on the actuarial career. So the idea was to make one of these 30 minute videos every every month on the actuarial career path. And as you can tell, it is almost the end of March and we only have one of them out. Well, this is the second one. This is now the, the second one. Um, so I don't know if this is March, February, could even be April. But what we discussed in, or maybe I should tell you guys why, yeah, it's been, it's been a crazy couple of months. Um, essentially what happened, and seeing that this is the career vlog, is I left Polygon in November last year, joined a startup. The startup has run out of money, and it's like, yeah, haven't really even been paid for, for February. Um, but still kind of like hanging in there and, and seeing what we can do. The company's hoping to launch its product at the end of this month. So a little bit of crazy crazy. Also was a little bit uh, under the weather uh, for a week. So a lot has been happening. But now you're probably saying, Michael, why, why did you leave Polygon, a company that is like one of the... I mean, probably the biggest crypto company in the world, um, although maybe is Binance bigger. I don't know. Polygon, one of the biggest crypto companies in the world to go in and join a little startup. So like, what were you thinking with, with doing that? And I mean, I went in full, you know, absolutely full knowledge, knowing that nine out of 10 startups fail, um, that the chance of this startup succeeding was very, very low. But in a weird way, it was almost like a little bit of a, how would I say, a bit of a backup plan. For a long time, I've been wanting to, to do a specific project. And I keep telling myself, you know what, I'll do the project later. I'll do the project later. Let me first work. Because when you're working as an actuary, there's a little bit of a curse. And that is that you get a very generous salary. So getting a very generous salary, and the reason why I say that's a, that's a curse, is because when you want to do your own thing or be an entrepreneur or do your own kind of business, there's that very big opportunity cost and you're like, oh, you know, maybe I should just do one more year or one more this. And and that was the whole thing is that I was going to start this project as soon as I hit 30. That was my, my idea was I was going to hit 30 and I was going to push three years into this project. And that was always kind of like the life goal. And then towards the end of 2021, um, I told myself, okay, not taking on any more clients. I was doing actuarial consultancy work. I'm not going to take any more clients. I'm going to see my actuarial work with uh, the, the ASSA Society, the Actuarial Society of South Africa. I was doing some educational content for them. And it was like, okay, once that work is done, I'm going to stop taking on any clients and I'm going to do my, my project. And that was when I was invited to a party. Um, got actually invited to this party as, as an artist because... For those of you who know on my channel, I also do NFT art. Been doing art since I think yeah, my first exhibition was back in 2016. And the idea was to do just one exhibition every single year. COVID hit, so I thought, you know what, why don't I go online? Um, I'd already been using the blockchain to digitally sign my art pieces because my art pieces are a digital medium, um, printed them on Perspex, and would use the Bitcoin blockchain, a website called Ascribe, where I would sign, create these like basically before NFTs were even a thing, uh, create these cryptographic signatures to prove that this was a one of one um, kind of piece. And then the idea was that whenever you sold the piece, the physical piece, you also transferred this digital ownership along with them. And if you couldn't do the digital ownership, then you knew that that item was a, was a fake. Not the best user experience. And of course, that website would eventually go go down. But what it did do was that it made me very familiar with art being on the blockchain. And I joined this website called Super Rare. I remember it was so weird for me to try, even though I was making digital art, I still felt like I had to print it onto Perspex. It still needed to have a physical manifestation in order for it to be art. And now on Super Rare, we were selling them purely as these digital assets, NFTs, and they started selling really well. So I even wrote an article, which I think it's like in the September 2020 edition of the Actuarial Magazine. I had just sold 10 pieces and I was like, this is crazy. People are actually buying my, my art. Um, of course, you'll know from my other NFT videos, for me now, I actually see that this is the future of art, not just a little side thing because of, you know, a lot of the friction and logistic burdens that, that it removes. So NFT and art, very, very powerful, doing very, very well with that. So fast forward to, this is what, September 2020, uh, like a year later, 
Um, I've just done a whole bunch of NFTs with some Instagram models. The one was in that Netflix show, Too Hot to Handle. They were selling really well. And I was just thinking, you know what, Instagram, NFTs, this is this is just the future of, of content. And I'm at a party, being introduced as the NFT artist, get speaking to these guys who've got, I think the one guy had a PhD in economics, the other guy had a PhD in something else. And then there was this other gentleman who had worked at Deutsche Bank for a couple of years. So these three Spanish guys, they're at this party and they're talking about how the American economy is going to crumble due to due to COVID. And me just wanting just, you know, a little bit of you know stimulating conversation. I go up to them and, and I drop a little, little bombshell. I say to them, now, of course, this was just for the sake of making conversation, which is what I do. I sometimes say things to say more things, um, not necessarily, you know, attach personal belief behind it. But the statement I throw throw to them is, is I say to them, COVID is going to strengthen the American economy. Boom. Okay. They look at me. They're like, what is this crazy artist coming up and, and saying something as silly as, as that? So they like look at me intrigued and they're like, why, why do you say that? I say, well, think about it. COVID is retracting the entire global economy. We're now in this you know, state of recession, the state of fear. People are going to rush into a very safe asset. The safest asset at the moment is the US dollar. It's, you know, it's, it's their cash. So people are going to flood in and buy the US dollar. The US dollar is going to appreciate and this is going to allow the Americans to print more of it, which means they're just going to have more money to do what they want to do with, which of course, the American economy did. What I didn't foresee was, you know, the war in Russia and Ukraine, uh, which then hit the food and oil and inflation and, you know, was like another disaster on top of, of COVID. But at the time, you know, this Russian thing hasn't hasn't happened yet. And I come in and I start explaining my, my position and we're having a little healthy debate. When at the end of the, the, the conversation, they kind of say to me, they're like, you know, how do you know, like so many things? Not, I mean, how do you know so much about the economy? But like, how are you, you know, able to talk so confidently about the the economy, um, and all of these different asset classes and everything like that? If you're an artist, because remember, I'd been invited to this party as an NFT artist, and I tell them, no, I'm actually an actuary. Um, you know, I just use NFTs for art, but I'm like, I think NFTs can be used for for Instagram. Told them about the whole thing I'd done with the instagram models and how successful that was i told them about this other art piece that i'd made that had sold for like a stupid amount i was telling about how in the future i could see netflix uh, you know basically giving their content away for free and how they would make their money is selling of nft so you would watch let's say your your favorite show uh, let's say rick and morty and then you could buy nfts that relate to the show and that would be a way to fund um, the creators and the whole show because with piracy and everything like that, these things are tending to, you know, basically you pay nothing to watch the content. And I said, Netflix will soon embrace that. Anyway, whole long NFT discussion, which I have chatted about in my other videos, but they look at that and they say, come work for us. Um, you know, we're, we're working at this company called, called Polygon. And I was like, what, what's a Polygon? You know, had never heard of it. And it was weird because I mean, I'm in the crypto space, but I was kind of like very sheltered from, from layer two. So I was very much on Ethereum, but these layer twos at the time, I wasn't like fully comprehending it, which I know looking back end of 2021, not knowing what layer twos were. And yet, you know, having been in the crypto space, um, I was definitely under, under a rock. Mm. So what happens is they offer me a job and turns out what had happened was that the Spanish guy was one of the the founders of a blockchain called Hermes, which was using zero knowledge proofs in order to do amazing things. And there was another company called called Matic that decided to basically Matic combined with Hermes and Maiden, an American blockchain, also doing zero knowledge things. And collectively, they came all together to form Polygon, hence the word poly, uh, meaning multiple. Polygon, it's multiple chains coming together, you know, to be like a layer two kind of solution. Although there was always an interesting thing when we were working at Polygon, we were like, what exactly are we? Are we a side chain? Are we a layer two? Um, you know, and then there was this whole thing of monolith blockchains versus modular blockchains. And I realized in the crypto industry, there isn't like a clear cut taxonomy on the various terms and that can create a lot of confusion internally, um, as well as I guess, just communicating to, to the general public. Anyway, I joined, uh, I joined Polygon and wow, 
what a what an awesome job it really really was was cool uh the first thing they got me to do was to create like a a mock presentation on on ferrari i'm just trying to think like am i allowed to mention brand names and and all that kind of stuff well it was a mock exercise um i can neither confirm nor deny whether we actually spoke to ferrari but at this time i was asked to to do a mock design for how i would create a whole thing for for ferrari which was weird because I actually had already thought of doing something like this uh, before. I thought, imagine having a little lucky packet. You might see in the background here, we, we've got Pokemon cards. So this is generally the idea. The idea would be that you'd buy like a lucky packet um, or a pack of, of NFTs. And instead of getting, you know, Pokemon cards inside, you'd get a bunch of random components. And if you've got random components, you might get quite lucky and also get a blueprint. If you have a blueprint and the components, you can combine them together and create a car part. And if you create all the car parts, the idea was that you got an actual Ferrari delivered to you. Kind of like a scavenger hunt kind of kind of idea. Because I was thinking, like, I was playing a lot with NFTs. I was doing my actuarial treasure map, which I'm still in the progress of, of doing. Um, although I'm a little bit worried now with ChatGPT being able to figure out all of the riddles. So, because uh, each thing on that one had a riddle embedded, but with ChatGPT, you can actually yeah, crack it quite quite easily. So that's why I'm just back to the, the drawing board there. I was thinking with chess and uh, brilliant moves. So there was a whole bunch of NFT ideas. And essentially that was how I started off at Polygon, was just to come up with crazy NFT ideas for various companies. And it was amazing because I got to do a, a lot of traveling, went to New York, uh, you know, the NFT NYC, went to ETH Denver. Um, I even went to a conference in Malta, but that was horrible because I got quarantined because they didn't accept the South African vaccine for, for COVID. And I was kind of like fighting them in the, the airport. So I was stuck in the airport for eight hours and then got quarantined. Um, interesting experience. Then where else? Oh, also did um, ETH Seoul and Korean uh, Blockchain Week, uh, which is actually where I met this company here called called Aussies, who have actually recently, they were recently in, in Cape Town. Um, and I was showing them around, absolutely love their, their set of technologies that they have. In fact, when it comes to decentralized finance, DeFi, it's an Aussie app called MeshSwap that I use. And it's cool because while working for Polygon, I started branching out you know, beyond NFT, starting looking at the metaverse, started looking at DeFi, started looking at all these other you know, DAOs, other components. And I was saying how you know, Polygon, we need a bunch of templates and airdrops and all these things to make it easier for people to deploy their projects. And that's when these Aussie guys released that exact project. I said, hey, I want to be part of the Telegram group. Then there was the Luna crash. Polygon wants to get more exposure to Korea now that Luna is, is gone. They're like, Michael, you know, you're already talking to, to some of the teams there. You know, come on board. Met them there. Great group of people. And even though I've left Polygon now, uh, when they came to Cape Town, I showed them around the beautiful city. Uh, they sponsor my go-karting now as, as well. You might have seen from the karting video that they... They're one of yeah, my big sponsors for, for karting this year. And it was just really cool, you know, connecting them to the whole crypto community here in South Africa, which is in a weird way, kind of what I guess what my job started morphing into at Polygon. I went from being this NFT subject matter expert um, to more of a business developer, which is crazy because we did this internal reorganization. They're like, Michael, you're now a business developer. And I was like, what, what does a business developer do? Which I've always thought is an interesting thing, you know, getting a job that <laughs> you don't even know what it does. I remember having to Google, like, what exactly does a business developer do? And essentially what it was, it was you would try and approach companies and get them to build on, on Polygon. The problem is Polygon, I mean, one way to, of thinking about it is that it's it's the new internet. It's the third internet. Uh, you know, we sometimes refer to it as, as Web3. Um but it's very much the infrastructure. So before you could build directly onto Polygon, you would need some sort of app. Hence why I like the Aussie guys with, with their apps, because I could at least go to various customers and say, okay, if you want to get started, you can use these guys as a launch pad. They had a decentralized exchange, so tokens could be swapped out. You know, they've got staking, so you can do uh, add liquidity. You know, they had all that kind of infrastructure that was required. And essentially that's what the business developer role essentially started to become at Polygon was unlike normal business developers who try and connect one company with one, you know, projects together. Like if you're working as a business developer for say PlayStation, you go to a gaming company, you say, hey, be an exclusive, we'll give you some money or we'll do this or whatever it is. And boom, you've got a, a relationship. 
With Polygon, we had to try and link three different things together. Of course, it started becoming uh, really complicated because these different entities were in different countries. There were different rules around tokens. Is this seen as a security if it's staking? It's all that kind of stuff. But essentially, what was quite fun with the role is, you know, Polygon figured out that, oh, Mike, Michael's an actuary, you know, what, what, uh, what is that and, and how is that useful? And they're like, oh, wow, okay, so you understand insurance. And then, so the role went from being NFT to business development just generally to kind of like honing in and focusing on, on insurance companies. So going in there, honing in on insurance companies, trying to see how blockchain can revolutionize insurance companies within, how it can kind of make fraud, um, internal fraud, less of a thing and other efficiencies and all these other wonderful things. So at this time, I'm busy giving talks. That's one thing I did a lot for Polygon is, is I spoke uh, at various events at East Denver. I spoke in Cape Town. There was an event called CryptoFest. I spoke in Korean Blockchain Week. I almost spoke. I was I was on the because I was like, like sometimes the backup speaker for some of the founders. If they couldn't make it or if their flight was delayed, then I kind of like, you know, went in last minute and, and at least spoke and, and said something about the stuff. Um, so I almost spoke at Korean Blockchain Week, uh, but I didn't. The, the boss managed to arrive just, just in time from the airport. But essentially, I would go in and, and give these talks. And the one talk I did was to a, a bunch of actuaries. And the one actuary then reached out to me and actually went to the same university as me. And they said, hey, I'm working for a crypto company that wants to build decentralized insurance. Um, do you want to come on, on board? And I was like, wow, this is really cool. I'm now going to be able to work as an actuary and in crypto. So it's kind of like, you know, if you look at the, the CV, you know, it's that double experience kind of, kind of thing. Because, of course, back in my mind, I still want to do my project, but I'm also you know, risk, risk averse at, at heart. And I'm like, okay, but you know, you want your CV to at least look good. And this is quite a nice role to come in as the senior actuary to build the capital model from, from the ground up. And in fact, it started being a lot more than that because I joined the company um, and yeah, they, it was interesting because they were like, we reinvented insurance. And I was like, okay, cool. How have you done it? Like, this is, this is quite cool. Let's, let's check it out. And I was like, this is horribly capital inefficient. Like it, it was, it was bad. I was like, no, 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 no. And it was the programmers. I don't think I was their favorite person because I was like, this, this is like, and, and fortunately, this is the nice thing as an actuary is you can build a model. You can come with a lot of empirical uh, analysis to show how inefficient it is. And I redesigned a completely new system and said, look how capital efficient this is. So to have the same coverage, you know, this you needed like $10 million. Yeah, you need like $1 million. It was like a no brainer to go with this alternative route. But of course, a little bit of pushback from the, the developers because they had already developed, you know, a lot of it and they didn't want to start from the scratch. So you kind of like learned a little bit on that, that compromise. Like, okay, we can't have this purely efficient thing that Michael's designed from the ground up. Um, has to kind of incorporate a little bit of their fragmented pieces and try to join it together and maybe compromise a little bit of efficiency so that we can still come in and, and deploy. But that was actually a lot of fun, was building up this capital model. In fact, beyond just the capital model, building the capital structure and, you know, kind of like figuring out how to do decentralized insurance and it's quite a cool thing because why you want decentralized insurance is a lot of protocols are getting hacked and it's like okay is there a safety net and this can be a system that actually provides that safety net and the lovely thing with insurance is that we know it provides value it provides peace of mind and so there is that inherent value generation which can be translated to the liquidity providers in the form of return and that's why I think they called it decentralized insurance because the capital coming in was basically crowdfunded and the insurance also coming in. The, the eventual idea was that anyone would be able to come up, create their own risk pool, create their own product and essentially be like a Lloyds of London uh, for crypto. Of course, you know, Lloyds of London uh, you can talk have a whole video on, on that and how difficult it is to to replicate something like that. And of course, it was it was a big salary boost as well. I mean, Polygon paid paid very well. Um, this new company paid even even more. So, for me, it was and also like I guess what was happening at Polygon was was quite a big structural change. So when I joined, I think Polygon had like a hundred and seventy people, and it was very much like part of the company was that you got to know everyone. You'd play these little ooh, 
my computer's going off the black screen, power's running out. Uh, should probably have charged my, my laptop before I did this. Um, but yeah, when I joined Polygon, the culture was very much everybody's going to get to know everybody else. We played these online games. Um, it was kind of, I joined towards, you know, end of the year. So there was Christmas, there was a lot of fun things. And it was a really cool environment where, I mean, there was even a chess tournament. Um, those of you who know, I, I love chess. Recently got back into the 1700s on chess.com. So feeling very, very proud and chuffed about that. But it was a very fun e environment. And then what happened was, I mean, and I was the, I think I was the first employee for the Polygon Enterprise team. And then what happened is they went on like a hiring spree and they just started hiring a lot of people. And I think Polygon went almost up to 800, 900 kind of people. Um, I kind of like just saw on the Slack channel, the Slack channel was just growing. And I think there were some non-employees or consultants. So maybe that number is a little bit inflated. But a lot of new people started joining. I mean, my team, when we went to Istanbul for like the team offsite, uh, it was like, what was it, 34 people? Which is crazy because before we were going to do a whole company offsite uh, in Dubai, and now we did a whole company, just our team, and it was 34 people, and it had grown really big. And with that came a lot of, and I guess it, it has to be when a company gets that size, a lot of employment um, policies and procedures and this and that, and you had to disclose what you were doing and what this, and then there were reviews, and essentially it became a lot of admin. For those of you who know me, I don't like admin. So I was kind of like, oh, this is losing its losing its fun. And also, once the team became that big, before, I mean, I was the guy who was traveling everywhere all over the world. It was a lot of fun. Now that the team was so much bigger, it was like, okay, we've got to give other people a chance, got to do this, got to do that. Or, oh, we've got such a big thing now. We've got to look at budgets, got to scale back. So I went from flying business class to, you know, not business class, which once you fly business class, you, it's really difficult. It really is difficult to to kind of go back. So there was a whole bunch of these things that were kind of tainting, I guess, the experience at Polygon. Polygon, amazing company. It was just personally. Personally, I enjoy more of the startup culture. I enjoy more of that kind of vibe rather than the corporate corporate setting. And so with Polygon very quickly t turning into this corporate you know, giant, I mean, it's one of the biggest crypto companies out there now, um, with big investors. And, you know, it was it was also like, we started hiring a lot of Americans and that also came in with a you know, big different culture before it was the Spanish and the, the Indian teams. And it's weird, like India, the culture is very similar to, I guess, to South Africa. You know, we both love cricket, um, you know, got on really well with the team in India. Um, the Europeans was also kind of like very easy to get on with, same time zone, all of that. But then the Americans, it was, I don't know, it was difficult for me to kind of, I guess, connect due to maybe the time zones were just different. It was just yeah, quite a big cultural cultural change. So all those things said, I kind of left um, end of November. Uh, I mean, I still hold all my Polygon tokens. I kind of took all the tokens I got from Polygon, um, well, my entire salary and just bought the Matic token, which, you know, when I started buying, it was at like $2 and then it went down to 30 cents. And now I think it's at like $1.10. So I was doing what they call the dollar averaging, but that just shows how much I believe in the Polygon project. So I kind of took that entire year's salary and and put it into the Matic token. It was kind of like, how do you sell or like use up a little bit just to kind of pay taxes because taxes was, was quite a lot last year. Um, but like the majority, just like I said, what I could kept into to Matic to have that exposure because really do believe in their their project and yeah, love Polygon over stuff like Solana and, and other stuff. Um, might regret that one day saying that if Solana's ever like, hey, we're looking for business developers and we see you've got experience on Polygon, you want to come work? And then they watch this video and I'm like, yeah, Polygon, way better than Solana. Um, <laughs> but yeah, essentially that was the situation where what I did is I decided, okay, not happy, well, not, not that I wasn't happy. It was just that I was getting, I guess, yeah, what's the word, frustrated or just, it wasn't as good as it was. So I thought, you know what? I want to do my own project already i've joined polygon as like for like a whole year just to see what it's like um i've kind of learned a lot kind of felt like you know the team is big enough that if i do leave it's not like i'm 
dropping any you know responsibilities on anybody else's lap and that the team will fall there was a lot of people around um i was able to stay on a little bit while they hired the the replacement got them up to speed lovely guy um we still even chat so i was able like okay cool i'm leaving the company on on good terms i'll join the startup if the startup fails we go and we do we do our own project and now it looks like yeah the camp the company that I've joined, I mean, like I say, they, they're they hanging on. They're hanging on. They're trying to find more funding. Um, the team has basically halved from 20 to 10 people. You know, it's going through a bit of like a, a rocky path. And I wouldn't be surprised if any day I got the email saying, hey, we're, we're shutting the door. But at the moment, we're still trying to, to stay on board. Um, but essentially, I now have my, my one eye on, on the project that I'm going to be doing. I think I should keep the project as maybe a bit of a mystery for for now. Uh, you guys can comment in the yeah the section down below what you think the the project is. Um, but yeah, it's it's essentially it's like you know what, let me go try to do my own thing. This was always the plan. Crypto distracted me the whole bull run. You know, I think it hired a lot of people who weren't in crypto or working in crypto got into crypto. Bull runs kind of ended. Yeah, we're in a bit of a weird state now with whole Silicon Valley Bank and still the the war in Russia and inflation and you know the economy is a little bit uncertain as well as the regulation. That was also another thing with crypto which was super annoying was all the regulation because like which regulator are we are we talking to? You know, it's like well, the Americans, the Europeans, the you know, it was like what's happening. Um but essentially yeah. I'm not, yeah, don't have any regrets. I mean, like I say, some people think I was very, very silly to to leave Polygon and join a little startup that has now now failed. And, you know, in hindsight, that does look like a silly, a silly thing to have done. But very grateful for the experience. Was very happy with the, the capital structure that I that I built. And I think if the company ever does, you know, get completely wiped out, I might make a video explaining how the capital structure works, why I think it's quite efficient. And just put it out there on the internet and then maybe you know another group of entrepreneurs pick it up and say hey let's let's run with this of course regulation and insurance it was i was also thinking like when i joined they were it was kind of Im implied um that they already had the licensing and then when i joined and i saw that no they were in the process i was like oh that's also like uh two very very different things uh, it's like saying to someone, oh, we're married to, oh, I really like her. I'm going to, you know, maybe ask her out one day and uh, and hope hope she remembers who I am. You know, it's like two very different, I guess you've both got the same intentions. But um, yeah, the, the actual state is is different. Anyway, these videos, the idea is to keep them to, to 30 minutes. Battery is running down low. I want to finish the rest of my coffee. So I know we, we've still got two minutes left. But in the philosophy video, we went like five minutes over time. So I think it's all cool to to wrap it up there. Um, although I guess, yeah, maybe I'll, what I'll, no, should I save it for the next lecture? I think, yeah, I'll save it for the next lecture because I guess lecture, vlog, podcast, whatever we're calling these things. Um, I know I ended that last one saying, hey, I'm going to continue my, my own career journey. You know, what was I doing? And now I know I've jumped. I've jumped. So I think I did in the first vlog from like when I started um, to where I, you know, left uh, Thought Express where I was building back in systems for insurance companies. And then I've left out a couple of years and I've jumped into how I'm like redesigning and building capital structures for insurance companies, which is weird. I didn't do my fellowship in insurance. I did it in finance. Finance is the thing that I would love to to redesign. But finance, it's, it's such a systemic thing, you know, that's all over that to redesign a financial system it's exhilarating, but it's kind of like boiling the ocean, very difficult. Whereas insurance companies are kind of like siloed, they're their own little corporations. It's a lot easier to be innovative there. Uh, you know, you can design it from the ground up, where finance is kind of like you just plug into the existing system. But like I said, we'll maybe save that for the next video, which will maybe be sometime in April, who knows. Uh, but as always, thank you so much for watching. Keep well and enjoy the weekend if you're watching this on a Friday or the week ahead if you're watching this yeah, any other day. Keep well, everyone. Cheers.